Now, last year saw an unprecedented level of discourse around diversity, equity, and inclusion across all facets of American life. While police reform was understandably the highest profile issue, there have also been growing conversations around the racial wealth gap. It's a tough decision for us to talk about this because banks have historically been awful to black and brown communities. Whether it was redlining, where lending institutions would refuse to mortgage homes for black people, or making black entrepreneurs jump through hoops to secure small business loans, banks have long undervalued black patrons. The consequences of this cannot be understated. The denial of ownership to black people has led to an enduring racial wealth gap. To put in stark terms, a 2015 stat from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston found that the median net worth of white households in Boston was $247,000. For black households, that number was eight. Eight, just eight dollars. But it's not all gloom and doom, though. There have been growing efforts by both banks and advocacy groups to create programs aimed at combating these widespread disparities. Joining me now to discuss how we can improve financial equity for black and brown communities is CEO and founder of the Lazoo Group and MIT lecturer and my dear friend, Malia Lazoo. Girl, I am so excited to have you. Welcome to Amplified. I just have to take a moment to just see you here. Congratulations. It's wonderful to be <laughs> on your show, Aisha. Ah, this is so awesome. So I, I got to say, you know, you and I sit and talk all the time about the inequities facing black and brown communities. We're talking about how to bridge the racial wealth gap. And, you know, you don't really think about, at least in our communities, banks playing a major role. In fact, we think about banks as exacerbating the problem uh, a lot of the time. But you and your brilliant career as an organizer have gone from literally the streets to the C-suite trying to figure out how to rectify this problem and have some experience now under your belt being inside a financial institution as a chief experience officer of a bank trying to figure out how to connect the dots with the people so I would love for you you know as someone who has seen all the angles here give us a sense of, of the trends and the challenges and the changes happening in, in financial services that are impacting us or maybe changes aren't happening and it's impacting us well, I think that institutional change is always slow, right? Um, but we are seeing opportunities and we're seeing that banks really are understanding that they're leaving money on the table. Um, you know, when we look at the fact that 50% of black and brown uh, families are under bank compared to 19% of white families, that lets you know that within that overlap, right, there are some bankable black and brown families that aren't getting the chance to get mortgages, which is where you start acquiring wealth for most Americans, which is how you end up with stats like the one you started, um, you know, this conversation with talking about $8 versus $250,000. It's not that white families have $250,000 in cash, it's that they have access to mortgages and, and ways to um, build wealth. And I think that's really what closing the wealth gap is about. And so one of the trends that we're seeing is especially in small business and banks like JP Morgan Chase and Bank of America have made large, bold commitments of $30 billion um, in loans and other bankable products. And I think it's important for our communities to make sure we count those receipts and we see that we are able to get into um, you know, traditional banking in real ways. You know, we're talking about trying to, you know, and I'll play devil's advocate here. We're actually talking about trying to take an underbanked and often unbanked group of folks who are disproportionately black and brown people in this country, right, and, and low-wage earners in this country, and fit them into the sector, right? And I, I'm just always reminded that it's really hard to dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. And I know that you are in the thick of this conundrum as you advise companies on how they can do better, especially banks, on how they can do better by the underbanked people they're already leaving behind and create products and tools and services that engage them. And then at the same time, trying to help entrepreneurs consider ways that we can have even more self-efficacy and take things into our own hands.
hands to build ourselves up and our families and our communities. So talk, talk to me about that conflict point, right? Where you like, yo, can we use capitalism in a way? Because capitalism is leaving us behind. Like, how, what, what do we do there? And like, how are you working to try to bridge those gaps? I think that the question of how do we liberate ourselves within capitalism um, is one that we will be having for, and I hope that we will be having for a, a long time because it is that important of a conversation, especially today on Indigenous Peoples Day, we can ask ourselves the question of how does one liberate themselves on stolen land, right? So capitalism itself is this quagmire when you're talking about justice and liberation. And I think what we want to do is a not be included in predatory ways, right? But but have ways to, um, as you said, start businesses, have flow of capital. And then we ourselves have to have a conversation about what does it mean for us to become capitalists? And, you know, does it mean we use slave labor? Um, is that something that we do as we're building our business? I mean, slave labor is a great way to get profits up. Um, and so you can make a strong business case for it. You know, so I think we want to start with the ownership and we want to start with equity. Um, but while we're pushing for that, we also have to be having real conversations about are we creating opportunities for our workforce, right, to have ownership in companies? How are we making sure that there's equity in every level of capitalism? And I think if there's any community who can figure that out, it's the black community here. Mm, I don't have a lot of time, but I want you, you know, you are, for those of you who don't know Malia Lazu yet, I'll tell you that she's been a longtime political activist, organizer, strategist, very much keeps her finger on the pulse of what's happening in, in policy and politics. I'm curious what your assessment is of the Biden administration and what it is or isn't trying to do around human infrastructure and trying to bridge racial wealth gap and connecting the dots for small businesses. I have been very excited to see all the conversations around small businesses. I mean, I think it's close to 99% of our um, businesses are small businesses. And so it's critically important to our economy that we support small businesses, especially in a time of a pandemic and you know everything that we're seeing um, with us needing to be able to respond to workers and what they expect to um, you know have rightly so. And so I think that what we're really going to be seeing with the Biden administration, hopefully, is a continual push. And I hope that comes with working with banks and incentivizing them to be able to do things like character-based lending. The FDIC can do a lot to incentivize banks. And um, I think it's important for us to make sure that we're, you know, that we look at the PPP pro program um, as a way that we got trillions of dollars out on the street and yet we still weren't hitting mm -hmm. black and brown businesses so however we look at you know equity we need to make sure that black and brown businesses are centered first and i think the biden administration is trying to do that and i hope to see that continue Malia Lazu, I so appreciate all of your insights and hope to have you back to talk more about all the things including what you're up to at mit thank you so much for joining me